Thank you for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. We are live Saturdays, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern from Studio M in Los Angeles. I am Steven Spear, and this is TalkRadio1.com for Saturday, the 19th day of June, 2019. My email address, steve at TalkRadio1.com, steve at TalkRadioone.com. If education is the key to creating a better world, then American schools are really not doing a very uh, good job of it. Some of the criticisms of our education system uh, include citation of incompetent teachers, improperly protected or corrupt uh, teachers by teachers unions, and outdated criteria curricula. Those criticisms are probably right, but there is a much less often discussed accusation against our educational system. That is, that the one-size-fits-all approach offered by the system to individual students who have widely varied capabilities and vulnerabilities and very different academic potentials is substantially ineffective and ends up unnecessarily depriving many young people and our country, and therefore our world, of the good that could result if a better system was implemented. implemented. My sister and I were raised by the same parents, but we could not be more different in our approaches to our daily lives. Philly and I have three children uh, who now in their late 30s are so different in their abilities of all sorts that our approach to each of them when they were children had to be substantially different. And I believe this is true for all people everywhere. Yet our schools and many teachers treat all students as if they were the same with predictable missed opportunities. To explore this question, it is my pleasure to welcome the author of The Cult of Smart, How Our Broken Education System Perpetuates Social Injustice to the Program. Frederick DeBoer, welcome to TalkRadio1.com. Thank you for having me. I just said that a major flaw with the American education system is a one-size-fits-all approach, but you think that omission is the central flaw of our entire society, leading to many, if not most, of the problems from which we suffer. Why? So I think it's important to say, you know, I prefer so much every conversation on education with this point, which is, I think, a point that is very uh, <clears throat> sort of understated in terms of understanding the whole system. It's really important to understand that the American system in particular and sort of ed- education systems across the world in general, none of this was planned. In other words, uh, the systems that we have in place now are systems that arose from particularly sort of historically contingent circumstances to fit particular historical needs and then evolved in kind of um, unguided and not particularly well thought out ways over, over the course of time. So I think the most obvious way you can see this is in like the university system. Okay. So uh, if we go back a hundred years, you know, now we think of the university system as being this great uh, engine of social change, of, of equality, and of bringing people to a new level of, edu- of economic opportunity. A hundred years ago, that assumption would have been bizarre. I mean, the idea that uh, college had anything to do with creating socioeconomic opportunity would have been seen as just flatly uh, sort of out of nowhere to people who worked within the system. Um, at that point, College was straightforwardly for the production of an elite. It was for the perpetuation of an elite. And it wasn't even particularly necessarily focused on academics for a long time. College was more about, you know, they would talk about training leaders because the idea was we've got this caste of people, in other words, uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant men who come from well-to-do families who they knew were going to go on to become the leaders of society. And the idea of college was to, train them in that purpose, right? Uh, Over time, college becomes more democratized. It becomes more open to people from other races and to women. Uh, And the idea of social justice gets grafted onto college. But it wasn't started with that purpose. And you can look at that and say that's the the same way throughout the entire system, right? Uh, The idea that uh, the goal of public K through 12 schools is to prepare everyone for college. You go back to 1970, that idea, again, would have been seen as totally bizarre. I mean, it was, it would just have been seen as 
an assumption that simply made no sense. And so as we look at the system, right, from from 10,000 feet, we always have to be bearing in mind that nobody actually planned this stuff. What has happened is that there was one particular pathway that you could go through in uh, our K-12 system that made you college ready. And then you went to college and you enjoyed the fruits of that education. But for the large majority of American K-12 through uh, schooling, the large majority of our history, that was a small percentage of students. Right. College preparedness simply was not a mass phenomenon, because if you go back 50 years, you're talking about college participation rates in most states between 10 and 15 percent. And that's even a fairly high number. Right now, the general assumption is that the entire K through 12 process exists to push kids into college readiness. And the problem with that, as you referenced, this problem with one size fits all is that, among other ways to look at this, uh, everyone is not made for college. Right. There are people who, number one, many, many students who lack the prerequisite ability necessary to succeed in college. And we know that uh, in large measure because 60 percent, you know, people at the how to define this number, but something like 60 percent of the people who start college never finish. Right. Uh, and. So they're failing out. But there's also a set of people who have the intellectual background, the intellectual skills necessary to complete college, but who don't want to go because for reasons of temperament, they're not set up for it. So what we have right now is a system that was never designed to force everyone into college, which is taking this big mass of humanity that has all different kinds of strengths and weaknesses and desires and interests and trying to force them into one narrow path that was not planned in the beginning to be a mass path. And so it's not surprising that the outcome is a lot of failure. Frederick DeBoer is a writer and an academic. He received his PhD from Purdue University. You have seen Freddie's writing in the New York Times, Harper's, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, Politico, Playboy, the New Republic, Foreign Policy, and, and others. You know, the 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 start of all of this as you described it makes it all the more interesting that i can quote from page 85 of the cult of smart uh, barack obama uh, says that said that the best anti poverty program is a quality education george w bush said there is no greater challenge than to make sure that every child regardless of where they live, how they raised, the income level of their family, every child receive a first-class education in America. And then George W. Bush would join with Ted Kennedy, a conservative and a liberal, to bring the country the program No Child Left Behind. Bill Clinton said during his presidency that in the new economy, information education and motivation are everything. And George H.W. Bush said education is the key to opportunity. It's the ticket out of poverty. So if this is so centrally accepted, and if if this is something that only, what is it, about a third of the country are college graduates, what then, what then should the president of the United States, whoever the president is, say about education? Well, the first thing they should do is they should tell the truth, right? So since 1970, okay, in, in the span of 50 years, uh, we have more than quadrupled the number of total uh, uh, post-high school degrees per capita. So if you look at college degrees, you know, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, doctoral degrees, professional degrees, per capita, so relative to the size of the population. We've more than quadrupled the amount of those in society. We're just a vastly more educated society than we were in 1970. And yet, working age poverty, which is the poverty rate that is relevant for this comparison, is no lower than it was in 1970. In fact, by some metrics, it's a little bit higher. And inequality has skyrocketed. So we have become no poorer. I mean, excuse me, we have become no more, uh, uh, less uh, poor of a country. We have no, no uh, lower poverty than we did in 1970. And we have more socioeconomic inequality, all while we became a vastly more educated society. So if you're 
any president from whatever party is going to tell the story about why people should go to should go to college, then they have to start with the fact that as a system for reducing poverty in mass and as a system for reducing a, a, a socioeconomic inequality, we've demonstrated that education simply does not does not work. It, it simply does not do what we're saying that it does. Now, what should presidents be saying? Well, they should say for people who have a certain set of strengths and who have a certain academic temperament, going to college can be a consistent way to go about securing a better life through getting a kind of job that requires a certain level of education and that rewards that level of education with higher income. That's true. However, they should also point out that a big part of the function of uh, college education as being a uh, economically rewarded uh, phenomenon is that it is rare. So I think this is a really, really essential point to make. We know that the college wage premium, the college wage premium just describes uh, the amount of money that people who went to college make relative to people who didn't. That number is still high. Uh, It is still a robust uh, number. People who go to college really do make significantly more money than people who don't. But we know that, among other things, that that is a, uh, a function of the rarity of the degree. In other words, the National Bureau of Economic Research did a a great big study and they looked at the college wage premium from from 1890 to 2005. Okay. So 115 years worth of data. And they showed that uh, in their words uh, to a remarkable degree, that premium is just a function of the ratio between the number of people who have a degree and uh, that require uh, have a college degree and the number of jobs that requires a college degree. In other words, it is a simple function of supply and demand. And of course it is right. Everything in economics is to some degree or another a function of supply and demand, which means that if we actually did the job that they want to do, if we did what so many of these politicians say that they want to do, and we gave everyone a college degree, we would find that, in fact, uh, uh, the uh, total uh, saturation of the market with people with college degrees would just completely undercut that the very economic premium we're trying to spread around, which again, that stems just from basic economic principles. And so one of the things you have to bear in mind is, is that yes, the college wage premium is still strong, but what's happening underneath that is that uh, from 2008 to 2018. So for in one decade, the percentage of Americans who has a master's degree grew by 7% per year. So we've seen a massive explosion in people with a master's degree over the past 10 years. And what that means is that there's what we call degree creep, that as a degree becomes more and more common, you need to then get a new degree, right, to put yourself into a rarer and rarer station. So you're just creating more of this artificial scarcity by moving yourself up into a new level of education. It's not sustainable. Uh, And it's not actually good for anything that's going on in the underlying economy. You know, I've never subscribed to the idea that the reason to go to college would be to make more money. Mm. And what you're saying, Freddie, about supply and demand makes perfect sense to me. I've always believed that the reason and the reason we sent our children to college, the reason I went to college was to learn about myself and to learn about myself intellectually, socially, emotionally, uh, sexually, uh, physically, to learn about myself and what my abilities and disabilities were. So was I the sort of person who could sit in a chair and focus on a book and do research for hours, or was I the sort of person who really couldn't do that? Am I? Do I have an appetite for learning, or do I not? All of those things, I think, are are facilitated by a college education, which is why I think the time for that, if there is a time in a person's life, would be when they're young to help them enter adulthood. And so I, I think you're right that it's not for everyone. I mean, we've always heard that all people are created equal, but I've never met two equal people in my life. You, you say at page 239 of The Cult of Smart, 
that to suggest we will ever achieve equality of any meaningful kind is to deny our nature. What does this say about the search for equality of opportunity or the search for the for equality of outcomes? Yeah, so I just think that, um, uh, you know, we have to bear in mind that, you know, equality in and of itself is a term that's so capacious it doesn't really mean anything. Uh, I think that uh, I think some people are under uh, a misapprehension that to be a leftist of whatever kind means to assume that you know, the ultimate goal is equality. But in fact, if you actually look at the left wing literature going back hundreds of years, there is an acknowledgement that like perfect equality is not only not achievable, it wouldn't be at all desirable. Right. So. If you want to go to the left most of left, you can look at Marx and Engels, who both independently in separate writings said, you know, equality doesn't make any sense as a goal. True equality is not uh, is not achievable because as long as you acknowledge any kind of liberty to be a different kind of human. Right. You're pre- you're preventing equality from happening. So we need to be a lot more specific about what we mean by equality and what kind of equality we want. Now, for me. I believe in equality of uh, uh, human uh, value. In other words, I think that any person walking down the street deserves to be taken as seriously by the system and by the rest of society as a human being uh, as anyone else. I believe in equality of rights. I believe in equality of protection under the law. But the idea that we are equal in our talents is just demonstrably absurd. Right. And in fact, you know, people have no problem with that when it comes in certain flavors. In other words, uh, you know, if nobody believes that we're all athletically equal. Right. I mean, uh, if I had spent my entire youth training to be a sprinter in track and field, if I had spent every day of my life practicing, I never would have made a, I mean, an Olympic trial, let alone the, won the Olympics, right? It's just, it's simply outside of the boundaries of what I've naturally been gifted. Me too. Yeah. And people don't have a problem with that, right? If you say, you know, does LeBron James have like a special innate inborn talent for basketball? And people will say yes. But that's also true with our abilities that are intellectual, that are creative, that are cognitive, right? And we have this uh, this sort of intuitive understanding when we're children, I find. Like, I, I, you know, to me, most people know when they're little kids, they look, they go to school and they, they look around their first grade class or whatever. And they know that they have peers who are good at different things. One kid is good at drawing. Another kid's good at math. You know, another kid is good at playing games or figuring out riddles, whatever. They have, an, they have a sense just from observing the world that not everybody has the same abilities. The problem is people feel that they can't come to that conclusion. And they feel like they can't come to that conclusion because we've gotten so locked into this idea that your ability to do certain kinds of abstract reasoning that are important in fields like computer science or biology or other or or finance you know fields that are highly remunerative right that that pay well you know these things have become so bound up in our basic definition of success that to admit that some people aren't good at those things feels like leaving them behind but it's really important to remember even 40 years ago right uh It was so I'm from Middletown, Connecticut. Okay, and on the edge of town, you know, Middletown, Connecticut still has to this day. Many of these have closed, but still has the factory at the edge of town, which for me is Pratt and Whitney for you know, Middletown, Connecticut is Pratt and Whitney, which is a defense contractor who makes engines for for fighter jets and things like that. Um, And one of my you know, the father of one of my best friends just retired after 50 years there. And when he was 18, he went and he got a job there. Uh, as a uh, on the assembly line, okay, out of high school, no college. He was there so long and he got there early enough that by the time he retired, you know, his title had the word engineer in it and he was paid commensurably the way that you would if you're an engineer. But, uh, you know, he started again 50 years ago. Uh, today, if you're coming out of high school, 
you can't wind up at Pratt and Whitney in any capacity without a college degree. And you certainly aren't going to get into a position to be called an engineer, right? Because now the credentialism has increased to the point where, you know, he simply would not have the opportunity that he had today. So once upon a time in the factory at the edge of town era of the United States, we had what I would call outs, right? We had paths, we had ways to, uh, emerge from high school and to find work that might not make you rich. This guy, you know, my friend's father isn't rich, but he owned his own home. He had a couple of cars for himself and his wife. He put three, three sons through college. He got a pension, you know, that doesn't exist anymore. And so because that way of life disappeared in the United States, we've now put so much pressure on being school smart. Um, and so this is a point that I have to keep making, you know, as I discuss this book is that, um, the, the intense fixation on academic skills and academic skills defined in a very narrow way comes from changes that happened to our economy that, uh, got rid of, uh, a certain path through life that provided dignity and economic security without being an academic star. Who should go to college? How do you know if you should go to college? How do you know if instead you should not go to college? So the first thing is you should want to uh, go to college, right? And, you know, that seems like a no-duh statement. But I taught college for uh, 10 years. I taught college students for 10 years. And one of the things that always depressed me the most was the number of students who said, I don't like this. I don't want to be here. I know I'm not good at this, but I feel compelled to do this, right? Uh, And so, you know, I taught at the University of Rhode Island for a while, and there was a a kid there. I was teaching him freshman writing. He was not enjoying it. Uh, He was not doing well. Uh, You know, I thought he was going to fail out. And uh, he did eventually pass the class, but, you know, I had a a sort of, you know, sit down with him and I, you know, sort of a let's get real conversation. And I said, you know, what are you doing here? You so obviously don't want to actually be participating in my class. And he said, you know, he made a, a very sensible point to me. He said, you know, what am I going to do as a 20 year old in Rhode Island if I don't go to college? Right. Like, what are the outs? You know, uh, people tend to think of the Midwest when they think of deindustrialization like Ohio. But deindustrialization really devastated New England, like Connecticut, where I'm from, Rhode Island, Massachusetts. They're filled with these old mill towns where the mill shut shut down and it just ruined the local economy. Right. Um, Rhode Island was filled with factories and mills and they shut down. Uh, The fishing industry in Rhode Island has been in decline for you know, the entirety of my lifetime, right? So this is a kid who looked around and just literally didn't have any other option, right? The, who is in a system in which going to college was the only choice for him. And so what, you know, that kid should not be in college if he knows he doesn't like school and is not good at it. Okay, now right? is that, that is, but, but Freddie, is that right? Because he got through, he passed your class, uh, perhaps he even graduated and he said, protesting at the age of 18 or 19 all the way along, I don't want it, I don't like it, I'm not good at it. But if he got the education and he went through it and he got himself to find within himself the, the resources to, to pull himself through, was it really a bad idea for him? Well, I mean, let's look at it. I mean, for him individually, you know, that depends on sort of like how that just the breaks, right? Like how things happened after school, as we've seen, certainly since the financial crisis in 2008 and 2009, one of the things that has become clearly obvious to many of us is that, you know, uh, while the overall economic picture for people with a college degree is much better than for people who only have a high school degree, the, uh, there's still a, a large slice of people in our in our country who did get the degree, who also took on a hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt, and who did not get the jo- kind of job they thought they would get and spend the next ten to twenty years of their lives struggling to pay off student. No, loans. no, and that's a very it's a very valid point. And if this young man to whom you referred uh, incurred huge debt, I would say, well, okay, now that pushes me the other way. But if he went to junior college and then he went to a state college where the tuition is relatively lower and incurred a smaller debt or perhaps no debt at all, Mm. and if he 
had to develop the skills to get himself to do something that he didn't want to do in the short run with the idea in mind of delayed gratification that it might benefit him in the long run. And then if he actually achieves that, doesn't that help his self-concept and help him to take his next challenge that he doesn't feel like doing, like, well, working on his marriage in an unpleasant time or spending time with his children when they're being difficult or working those extra hours to figure out where his next raise or his next value contribution can come from so he can make more money. Is, wasn't he bettered by this unpleasant experience? Well, but so I guess here's the question, right? Like, um, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not interested in arguing that he may not have had his life improved by forcing himself through school. I hope that he went on a graduate. I don't know. Um, we must bear in mind, again, that a, there is a, uh, a very large slice of people who start who never finish and who take on student loan debt along the way. So after they drop out, they're forced to pay back loans through uh, jobs that do not have the, the wage advantage of a college degree. But it, he very well may have done better for himself. And I'm glad about that. But I want us to uh, abstract away and to look from a, a higher vantage point, from the standpoint of society, and say, okay, this kid um, – he went to a fairly unex- inexpensive public school. And when we say fairly inexpensive, now this kid certainly was not getting any academic scholarships. I can tell you that. Okay. Um, somebody, whether it was through his parents paying him or through him taking on student loans was paying for him to get through four years of a, okay, pretty good public university like URI. Somebody paid somewhere on the order of 50 to $60,000 for him to go to school. Yeah, that's the best case scenario. Right? Is he he paid somewhere along the line, whether it was his parents himself or through some combination of whatever, something somewhere between fifty and sixty thousand dollars were paid for him to get through to just to pay tuition and get through school. On top of that, URI is a public university, and while we don't fund our public universities to nearly the degree that we used to do in terms of per student contributions for for the state, the state is subsidizing him. Right. The federal government is also subsidizing the university in a variety of ways. Okay, So we have a certain pile of money and we uh, have a kid who needs a job and who needs a, a path through life that is productive and makes sense and contributes to society. And the question is, is this taking this kid who was by any account a marginal student running him through the academic rigor of, with a lot of skills and and uh, learning and education that I value because I'm a nerd, right? Like I'm, I'm the kind of person who, who cares about all that stuff, but he clearly didn't value putting him through those classes, making him sit through a class in classics and organic chem, right? To, in order to get him. And then, you know, again, him paying somewhere on the order of 50 to $60,000, whether in parent contributions or student loans or whatever, plus all the thousands of dollars that he's being subsidized by the various levels of government to then put him onto a job market where he just says, okay, I've got this sheet of paper and the sheet of paper in some vague sense indicates to the various companies who are hiring that I'm worthy of being hired. The paper tells those companies almost nothing about his actual ability, right? Uh, the companies almost universally don't actually care about the skills that he acquired, right? So one of the dirty secrets about this whole system is that, yes, there are certainly uh, fields where you need the specific skills that are being taught at college, and then you apply them in your job. But in for a very large number of these white-collar occupations, right, these sort of nondescript uh, general office jobs, which have vague titles, you're not actually applying college learning in those places. Not at all. What the, co- not what at the all. college degree is doing is it's saying, okay, this person has it in him to sit still through classes for four years, right? From the from a you know ten thousand feet, that just seems to me to be a kind of hideously inexpensive system, where there must be ways in which we can take this human being and say, okay. This kid's good at some things because everybody's good at something. You know, how can we discover what this kid cares about and is good at and then match him with a job where he can become a contributing member of society and where he can at least secure like a minimal level of 
financial security for himself. All right. So let's take your your first idea that the, on, in the answer to the question of who should go to college and who should not go to college, that mm-hmm. one for some people, one test would be whether they want to be there. What's another one? How else do you know if you should go to college? Yeah. So I think that one of the things that you should uh, that should matter a lot is um, <clears throat> Do you have the kind of uh, abstract reasoning skills that, yes, are measured by things like the SAT that allow you to apply your general reasoning and analytic ability in a variety of contexts so that we can trust that you can put yourself to work in various different content domains Rather than thinking of everything in terms of what are the underlying skills, ability, knowledge that I have. In other words, do you have a level of generalizable co- uh, cognitive ability that lets you adapt to the various things that we put into a liberal arts education to create a broad base of knowledge that you can then flourish in a variety of different content domains? And I think that there is an unfortunate tendency to assume that uh, the, uh, you know, intelligence is all about that kind of, you know, generalizable cognitive ability when in fact, you know, you can be someone, right? Like, so, you know, for example, we talk about things like trade school, which is a complicated conversation, but let's think about trade school for a second. If you go to a trade school and you just, I'm going to be a machinist, Right. There are all kinds of, you know, cognitively demanding tasks in being a machinist, right? If you want to go and be a woodshop person, there's a level of math involved. There's a level of spatial reasoning involved. There's a level of physics involved that is quite advanced. But what those things differ from a liberal arts education that you get in college is they're very specific and narrow domains, So it's easier to be good at those things, right, and to know you're good at those things than to assume that you have the kind of broad base of knowledge that's applicable to a college context. So one of the things that I would love to have is an understanding, first of all, that while generalizable cognitive skills are great, and that's if you're that kind of person, you're very blessed to have that. But it's also valuable to have the ability to say, okay, I'm really good at this one thing. And it doesn't make sense for me if I know I'm going to be a great machinist to go sit through a philosophy class or a Chinese language class or an organic chemistry class when that's not what I want to apply myself to. So not only do you have to have the the want to, to, for college to make sense, you should have a generalizable level of cognitive ability where you can apply yourself to different academic domains. But we as a society should recognize that that's one way to be smart. But it's not the only thing that matters, and that no, being it's not. like you know we need it, we need we need foxes and hedgehogs. You know there's no saying? question we do, and here's here's where my problem comes in, and I and and I want to say before I say what I'm going to say, I want to say that the cult of smart, how our broken education system perpetuates social injustice, is really well written, well argued, well constructed, and it's uh, it's a it's a very interesting read. Uh, it's something that you could, you, it is thought provoking, and it provoked me to thought. And I'm glad we're talking because I, I, I need to make this point, Freddie. Yeah. So far in what you've described, I should not have gone to college. I had no academic interest, no academic talent. I couldn't sit still. I had ADD. I spent the majority of my time in kindergarten through the eighth grade sitting either outside the classroom or in the principal's office because I could not stop talking and I couldn't sit still. Uh, my, I, I've listened, kindergarten through the 11th grade, I never got a B on my report card. I also never got an A. I was a C and D and F student and certainly shouldn't have gone to college. But I went to college where I didn't really feel like I was very competent at it at all And I got through college and I went to law school and I graduated law school and I've been practicing law for 43 years and I love it and I help people and I make a difference. And and had I not gone to college and law school, I don't think my my potential would have been fulfilled. Now, I'm one anecdotal case, but if we went by whether I, as an 18-year-old imbecile, because 18-year-olds are mostly imbeciles, but 
We certainly think we know everything. If I had decided on my of my own volition, I'm going to not going to go to college because I really, really don't want to be there. And if I had done all the other things I'd have rather done with my time, and then if I hadn't gotten what I got in college, which was I developed the ability to artificially force myself to sit in a chair and to do something and to follow a structure and to fulfill obligations and to show up on time and to do things properly. Had I not developed those skills in college, I wouldn't have made it through law school and then I wouldn't have been a lawyer. Comment on this. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that what you're talking about is the reason that I'm not into like harsh tracking. Okay. Now to tracking, when we talk about tracking, we're talking about sorting students into different paths Sometimes just in simply like A, B, and C reading group, or like A is better and C is worse. Um, sometimes it is more of a vocational versus academic path. Now, there are virtues to tracking systems. So the German system, for example, at around age 12, uh, students divide into an academic track and into a, a vocational track. And um, in that system, it's actually well-respected and people like it a lot for a variety of reasons. Uh, it is important to say, right, that in Germany, they have uh, much more powerful and widespread labor unions and uh, simply a, a more uh, uh, a far more socioeconomically equal economy in general. So that if you go on the vocational track and you're a German student, it's not at all unusual for you to be, end up making the equivalent of an American making a hundred thousand and one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. So that's an important caveat. But I'm not into harsh tracking systems. I think ultimately, anyone who is believes themselves to be someone who should go to college should be able to pursue that opportunity. And I want to create structures that both enable people to declare themselves for one path or the other in order to make it easier for them to navigate the path. Right to avoid onerous uh, uh, standards, uh, which really do hurt people, which we can talk about. While still, if you're someone who wants to end up in college and you go there, um, you have the opportunity to go there. Now, I'm not naive. I certainly recognize what you're saying is that absent the push for everyone to go to college, there are some people who won't go to college who should have, right? There will be some people who could have gone to college, discovered skills they didn't know they had, and flourish in that setting and go on to really productive lives. And I recognize that that's a downside of what I'm talking about. And I don't dismiss the concern that you're raising. But here's what we have to bear in mind, okay? In a three-year span, from 2014 to 2016, 4 million people with significant student loan debt dropped out of college, right? In that span, right, 4 million, just in just in three years, 4 million people entered into the system where they owed more than $20,000 in student loan debt without a college degree and where they had to start paying it back. And this has to be the flip side that we understand of what you're saying. Absolutely. You're abs- no question. Yeah, you're absolutely right that there's people who are, are who. Uh, are not going to get pushed into the college system who should have gone. But we always have to bear in mind, there's a big, big slice of Americans who go to college, discover that they lack even minimal prerequisite skills. And because many, many colleges, not just for-profit colleges, but many colleges, even colleges that have names that are well-known and respective, are fundamentally predatory in how they pursue Uh, students who they know to be inadequately prepared, but they want the tuition dollars. Uh, And they get into the system, they take on debt, they fail out, and they're in a humanitarian crisis. I mean, they really are. And so it's a a, a balance of interests. I would love to believe that there is a system that we can devise that both seeks out people like you who uh, don't do well early on in your academic journey, but then discover potential that you didn't know you have and then go on to long and successful law careers. And while also helping people to avoid college who have to, realistically, I know there's always going to be a trade-off. What I, a point that I just want to stress is that right now, the push to, to get everybody into college, I mean, you know, you should, people should, be, should under, understand there are several states where uh, the percentage of students from your graduating class 
who go into a college program, a state college program after high school, re- directly results in more funding for your high school, right? Uh, Which sounds great, right? Okay, we're rewarding college, uh, high schools that graduate college-ready kids. But of course, that creates an immediate financial incentive for those high schools to represent students who are not college-ready as college-ready because they want the funding. And so they push these kids into college. What happens to those kids? They get into college. No one's looking out for them. There's no remediation efforts. They inevitably fail a bunch of classes. They fail out of school. And now they're out on the street with a lot of student loan debt and without any support. And so, you know, it's just important to understand that, like, there are victims, real world victims of our intense need to put everyone through college. So in in uh, chapter five of your book uh, and and the book The Cult of Smart: How Our Broken Education System Perpetuates Social Injustice, which by the way, ladies and gentlemen, you can buy right here, right now on the Talk Radio One dot com website. Just click on the icon, make the purchase. Uh, I I think you'll appreciate this book. In chapter five, which is entitled "Does School Quality Matter?" Not really. That's the title. Uh, I went to Cal State University of Dominguez Hills. This is a uh, small college where uh, it's it, – when I went, uh, in 19, when I started there in 1971, it was not at all hard to get into, and yet I barely got in and was on academic probation because of my uh, uh, underperformance uh, through high school. I went there for four years and graduated, and I think in many ways I got a better education there than some that went to Ivy League schools to whom I've been exposed throughout my career. But then I would think that because that's where I went, and and I, I liked it and ultimately came to really appreciate it. So I think I probably agree with you that this striving for people to get into the very best school that they possibly could uh might not really be uh might not really be the uh the 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 center of of the goal you say at page 37 of the cult of smart you quote uh, Ross Duthot uh writing in the New York Times elite universities are about connecting more than learning that the social world matters far more than the classroom to undergraduates, and that rather than an escalator elevating the best and brightest from every walk of life, the meritocracy as we know know it mostly works to perpetuate the existing upper class. And mm. and you you had a very and that's in a different chapter than the one I was referring to, and then. Back at the introduction of the book, you had a very interesting take on the 2019 college admission scandal. Talk about your view of the 2019 college admission scandal. Well, you know, I, you look at the kids who um, uh, are were sort of. Uh, I mean, most it seems that you know many of these kids actually didn't even know what their parents were doing. Uh, uh, so I don't want to indict the kids themselves, but you know, you look at these these students and. Um, from the outside, you'd say these kids have every advantage, right? Their parents are wealthy. Some of their parents are famous, right? Uh, many of them went to exclusive uh, private schools. If they didn't, then they went to the kind of public schools that have essentially function as private schools because the areas where the schools are are so wealthy and expensive that only the richest kids can go to them anyway. Uh, they have access to the tutors that they need. They have access to all the test prep that they, they could possibly want. They can do all the expensive a- extracurricular activities. And yet, uh, despite all that, they uh, faced such challenges in getting into college uh, that their parents felt like they had to literally break the law and risk arrest to put them through to, into the best colleges. There's a few things to say about that. The first thing to say is that I think everyone needs to understand um, elite colleges. One of the things that they are ranked on in rankings like the new U S news and world report uh, is how low their acceptance rate is. In other words, if you're Harvard, Right. And you can say that you only accepted four percent of your applications and Yale accepted five percent of their applications, then uh, it makes you look better in the rankings. Now, 
I think that those rankings are frankly destructive in all manner of ways, but this is an obvious one. One of the things that these schools have done is the population of teenagers keeps getting bigger and bigger because population growth is a thing, but they're not letting in any more kids than they did when I applied to college 20 years ago. Right. Uh, Which means that the competition for the seats just gets fiercer and fiercer and fiercer. And one of the things that happens when you have a competition that gets that fierce is it stops meaning anything. So there was years ago, there was a a former Harvard admissions officer and he admitted, I'm pretty sure that this was in a uh, editorial for the New York times. And he said, um, he admitted 90% of the people who apply to Harvard could come to Harvard and flourish as students, right? But they only admitted 5% of those students. And so he was saying it comes down to you're, you're, you're parsing such fine grained distinctions between different students that you're ultimately talking about what amounts to a lottery. So that's one thing to bear in mind throughout all of this is that these kids are just facing enormous status competition pressures to get into good schools when the competition to get in these schools is so absurd that it essentially is outside of their hands. But the other thing is just that talent is real. Right. The one thing that these ki- that these parents couldn't give to these kids, the one thing that their money couldn't buy was the kind of just raw, pure talent, that academic talent that some people are just blessed with. And most of us aren't. You and know, this is something that you talk about at uh, page 60 in the Cult of Smart. You say there's a group of students that needs the help of our policy apparatus more than any other group, yet they are rarely, if ever mentioned in our policy debates. We know that they are performing poorly in the classroom and in the working world, yet no one proposes programs to help them. They are systematically shut out of the most coveted colleges, the best paying jobs, often eat even out of stable and happy marriages, yet to speak of their plight often invokes incredulity. They are certainly the most disadvantaged subset of our student population that you can name. And I, I, I ask everyone who's listening, just pause and think, who do you think we're talking about right now? Freddie, we're talking about the untalented, aren't we? Yeah. So, I mean, this is, you know... Um the kind of thing that can get you canceled as they say. Uh, in, but um, there's overwhelming evidence that people are just born with a certain level of academic uh, underlying talent. Now, as with anything else in life, it's really, you know, what you do with that talent is super important, right? We talk, we're talking before about being like an Olympic caliber sprinter. Uh, it's a certainty that there have been people in history who have been born with that kind of talent who never developed it or who never had the, the ability to develop that kind of talent to go to the Olympics. So obviously the expression of that talent and what you do with it matters. But um, again, we know that different people have different levels of different abilities and different things. And one of the things that we know is most people, they are born with a certain level of academic talent and they tend to get somewhere around the sort of, you know, maximizing that talent more or less, unless they're neglected, living in poverty, you know, if they, unless they have some court, sort of a, a major drag on them using that talent. Uh, and so what ends up happening is, uh, and this makes people very uncomfortable, but it's true, m- most of us sort ourselves into a given ability band very early in life, and we tend to stay there. In other words, if you take, you look at kids and where they sorted themselves in, in first grade, you know, into different levels of ability in school. What kid is doing the best in their grades? What kid is doing the worst? And you follow them throughout their their lives. They tend to stay in that place. Now, there are exceptions. You just said that you're an exception, right? You, You struggled as a student when you were young, and then you discovered a particular ability and you blossomed later on. That's great. But in general, we tend to stay in a particular point to a degree that I think is kind of shocking to people. So, we can collect data after a student finishes kindergarten. So when they're five years old and we can use that to make meaningful predictions about how they'll do in college. To pick another thing, uh, third grade reading group. 
So reading group tends to be an A, B, or C phenomenon, right? High reading group, medium, low. So that's a very coarsely gradiated predictor. It's not a very precise predictor in the beginning in terms of having a lot of different levels. And yet third grade reading group is a really strong predictor of whether you'll graduate from college. So in other words, something that's happening when you're nine years old tells us with very strong predictive accuracy what will happen when you're 22 years old. Um, We can go further than that, right? You give kids uh, SAT scores when they're 13. Uh, Those SAT scores give you really good predictive information about, for example, will they ever have a PhD? Will they ever publish a book? Will they ever hold a patent? So these are all things that tend to happen after the age of 30, and yet What's happening in their testing at 13 uh, predicts it. Um, For obvious reasons, right, this makes people really uncomfortable because they think that it forecloses on possibility. They think, well, if we know how well people are going to do later in life when they're young kids, it feels like it offends our sense of justice that everyone should have all the opportunity available to them. Again, it's important to say – individuals can always exceed or fall bef- b- behind their prior performance. And this is, fairly open. this is why I'm so torn on this very subject, Freddie. I, yeah. uh, on the one hand, I think it's critically important to have all the information available always in life. Information is freedom. Information is power. If I have true, reliable information, then I, I can make better decisions. And on the other hand, Information that is predictive, information that says, here's how it'll probably turn out, can discourage people from availing themselves of opportunities where they might do very, very well. So I have, I have great trouble with, with uh, being steered by, by data in terms of what I should do in the distant future Although I use that data all the time in deciding who to hire or what investment to make or what decision to make or what recommendation to make to a client or a friend or a family member. So I'm, I'm very torn about this because the, this, the, I'm, I'm a, I'm a believer in data and, 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 and the scientific method, of course, and yet I know that the discretion and the intuitive insight that we have to bring to decision making can many times suggest the opposite and end up being correct. What do you do with that? So I think that um, it's just, I think this gets back to the same question of like recognizing that there are some students who are not college material, often in terms of temperament as much as by talent, without instituting harsh tracking, I think it's you do the same thing with this kind of analysis. You never, ever let the fact that we know students will tend to follow the same academic path that they start at throughout life. We never let that foreclose on possibility for anybody. In other words, we don't say, oh, okay, this third grader is in the bottom reading group. So therefore, we're going to put them into a different kind of school where they'll never have the chance to go to college. I'm completely against anything like that, in part because, again, you know, when we talk about these dynamics, we're talking about large trends. And there's always individual exceptions to large trends. And it's unjust, right? It is deeply unjust to make someone suffer if they violate those large trends, right? Um, what we do do is, we, is we, we say this, like, look, every individual student has to have the opportunity to uh, fulfill their potential to the best of their ability. However, we have to look at the system and not just, and yes, as a matter of justice for teachers and schools that happen to have students who are in demographics who struggle, that's that's part of it, but also just in terms of like intelligently thinking about resources and having realistic expectations. We can't be, we can't maintain this blank slate mindset that says if you have a kid who starts at the bottom in kindergarten and they graduate from high school, but they're still near the bottom of their class. If we look at that school system and say, "Oh, you, you know, you're a failure of a school system." Because you didn't take this kid who was near the bottom and bring them to the top. That's the kind of thing that we thinking that we need to afford. We need to leave possibility for every individual student to do everything that they can. 
But we need to have realistic assessments about how our schools function, how our teachers function, and what they can realistically do. We have to bear in mind that a great teacher can do great things, but what a great teacher can't do is they can't reach into a kid's brain and rearrange their neurons to make them as academically gifted as one of their peers who just happened to have one genetic lottery. So I think that we we maintain as much possibility for our students to flourish to the degree that they're able. We don't institute any kind of harsh tracking that would it would limit their potential. We, we enable them to be able to exceed their previous station and we celebrate when they do. But we also recognize that like, if the expectation is that we're going to take kids from the bottom performance quintile and say, okay, we're only going to be satisfied if they reach the top performance quintile. We say, we recognize that's a completely uh, irrational and unfair demand and we can't base the system on that. Freddie, and I think that- right now, it's all our whole system is so set up on the idea that everything is possible. Freddie, I, I think that's well put. And I, I think that's a good answer to that. I, you say very clearly in the book that Superman is not flying to the rescue, that there is no easy solution. In fact, there's no real solution to all of this. And yet in chapter eight, you come up with several ideas as to what you would suggest. I want to do a lightning round with you because we're running short on time. Okay. And I'm going to tell you what you said. Give me a very brief, very brief summary of, of, of what you mean by this, and then let me react to each one. You think that as a solution to some of these challenges, we should provide universal child care and after-school care, meaning government paid for uh, universal child care and after-school care. Why do you think that's a good idea, briefly? Uh, um, I think that... Uh, one of the things that school does that we don't recognize enough as enough because we don't, you know, value this function, but what's an essential function is that schools are uh, very safe. Despite what people think schools are public schools are extremely safe for the children, warm, enriching environments where kids can go, where they have free lunch and free breakfast, et cetera. Um, I think that uh, for simple egalitarian reasons, I want to extend the, uh, uh, the reach of government to be able to, uh, uh, provide safe environments for these children who need them. And in fact, the Biden administration's child tax credit plan is something like that. I think I agree in in substance with you, but I would never have the federal government do it. I would have the individual state and local governments mm-hmm. do it because I think the different needs of different places uh, are are so radically different that resources could be more efficiently allocated elsewhere than to, for example, school meals in conditions where that's not necessary, and two school meals, for example, where you have conditions where students are not getting nutrition at home. I agree. Next suggestion you have is lowering the legal dropout age to 12 instead of 16, which is what it is, I think. Is that nationwide? I know it is in California here. But you want to lower the legal dropout age to 12. Why? Yeah, there's a couple of states where it's still 18. I want to lower it to 12 with parents' permission, which most parents won't give. So I think it's important to say. Um, I think that if someone knows that they're not a school person, uh, and their parents agree that that they're not a school person and that they have the kind of resources to be able to drop out and to still be able to have a life in which they have a stimulating environment. I think that we should not force them through the school system. I think that, uh, you know, it's important to bear in mind that, like, you know, the, the, uh, the fundamental assumptions that underline the academic system, right, again, we're applying to the entire population the kind of educations that were once restricted to people who actively sought out that kind of education. There are good things about that, as you've said, but there's also a problem where uh, there really are people who legitimately are not school people who, who just simply will not vibe with what happens. And it's important to say people say, oh, well, you know, these kids are going to drop out. You're, you know, you're, 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 you're giving them no opportunity to sort of flourish in school, but there's lots of kids who don't flourish in school anyway, right? The alternative that to, that to me is not like, oh, these kids will, will go on and they'll become straight A students. They'll clog up the system. They'll be repeatedly suspended. They'll skip school. They'll be chronically tr- a truant. They'll never get their degree anyway. I right? had never. Why not, why not get some of them out of the system voluntarily? I had never thought about this issue until I read about it in The Cult of Smart. 
I was surprised to find that I agree with you, but I think perhaps for different reasons. It's Mm -hmm. my view that outside of basic life safety issues, parents should be able to decide whether their children attend school or homeschooled or whatever it is they think. I would spend a good deal of effort educating parents as to how to raise children and alternatives and ideas for how to help them be better parents and therefore raise their children for brighter futures. But I don't think I'd have legal requirements. I think legal requirements should be few and and rare and effective but I'm not big on telling parents you must keep your kids in school for a particular amount of time. I agree. I think that, uh, uh, again, my whole approach is let's recognize the diversity of the human experience, which includes kids who can't do school in the traditional sense. Which is fascinating to me because you are a self-proclaimed leftist and Marxist and socialist. And if I were to apply a label to myself, it would probably be moderate libertarian, moderate conservative, uh, social liberal, uh, but financially uh, quite conservative. And yet I found myself in agreement with you when it came to policies far more often than I would have expected, which of course tells us that all these labels that you and I would use to describe ourselves are probably both inaccurate and unnecessary. I hope you're right. Yeah. I hope hope one day I hope we evolve beyond those. (laughs) Another suggestion you had was eliminating charter schools. Why? Uh, So I just, I think that the, I mean, I have written at length about this. Um, Charter schools randomize via these lotteries and it's through those lotteries through which the research is done that people say establishes a advantage for attending charter schools. Um, in fact, that advantage, even in that research, is very weak. But even that is, uh, to me, the product of the fact that these lotteries can't actually be trusted. The thing is, is um, in many, many cases, these charter lotteries are implemented 100% by the schools themselves, which have every reason, right, to manipulate the outcome in order to give themselves the most talented, easiest to educate students. And it's a profoundly weird scenario where you have this, this really enormously important selection mechanism. You let the institution that's going to benefit from that selection mechanism uh, control it. And nobody asks, are they being honest? It's a very strange scenario. Freddie, I want to say thank you so much for being with me here today on TalkRadio1.com. I have enjoyed it, and it's thought-provoking. Uh, and uh, next time you write a book, be in touch with me because I'd love to have you on uh, the show again. I would love to. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest has been Frederick DeBoer. He is the author of The Cult of Smart how our broken education system perpetuates social injustice. I want to tell you that you can buy this book right here, right now on the talkradio1.com website. I recommend this book. It is a very interesting study in it. As I said, Freddie defines himself as a a, a leftist, a socialist, a Marxist, and he is remarkably clear in his thinking. You can see different places where core beliefs of his come through in the most rational and well-thought-out ways, and I have a great deal of respect for that. Um, my uh, And my thanks, by the way, to Robbie De, uh, De Benedetto, uh, my good friend who recommended uh, Frederick DeBoer's work to me and drew it to my attention. Thanks, Robbie. My next show will be one week from today. My guest is going to be John Avlon. Uh, He is a journalist, a political analyst, and an anchor on CNN. He was the editor-in-chief and managing editor for The Daily Beast. He's been on the show three times before. We will welcome him back to discuss Washington's farewell, the Founding Fathers' warning to future generations. That's one week from today. Next week, next Saturday, that's June 26, 2021, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Use our PayPal link, our Amazon link, and our eBay link if you want to support the fine programming here on TalkRadio1.com without costing you anything extra. My email address, steve at TalkRadio1.com, steve at TalkRadio1.com. Thank you so much for listening today, ladies and gentlemen. I am Steven Spear throughout the country and around the world. This is TalkRadio1.com.